All right, welcome to another edition of the Horseman Pro Football Talk podcast. This is our week 17, our final week recap episode. Not that we're not, not that we're going anywhere. This is just the last regular season that we are going to break down the regular season games. And I'm Brad. This is Zach. And I'm Hefe. And we definitely want to thank you again for listening, watching, whatever the case may be. We tell you that every week. We really do appreciate it. This isn't the end of the road for us. We got a lot of things coming up with the playoffs. We have a special guest or two lined up that we're going to bring in uh, for the playoffs. And then uh, as we break down the Super Bowl, and then uh, we'll put together a schedule and we'll come back out uh, around draft time and we'll hit it again for next year. So please stay with us. Please subscribe, tell all your friends, kind of the whole thing, and uh, help us make next year bigger and better than this year. So we, uh, man, we got a lot to talk about from yesterday. Yesterday was. Um, as an NFL fan, I've been an NFL fan for a very, very, very long time. Uh, twice as long as just about anybody my age will tell you they've been a fan. And uh, yesterday was one of the most fun days for me, despite it not going completely the way I wanted it to go. Yesterday was a really, really, really fun day. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about some of the big news from the, yesterday, some of the big news from the season, some of the coach firings. We can break down, we're going to break down a couple individual games. Let, let, let's go with the big one. All right. This team, uh, we, can, we can play a little trivia game if you want. This team, I was going to say Zach and I, this team was not on my AFC playoff prediction list, but may win the freaking Super Bowl. Who may that be? Can you form that in frame of a question? Well, you did. But can you frame the answer in the form of a question, Jeopardy style? Who is the Buffalo Bills? Who is ding, 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 ding. Who is the Buffalo Bills? Yesterday, the Buffalo Bills looked freaking unbeatable. I'm telling you right now, if the Buffalo, Buffalo Bills continue to play that way, they, they, they might win this whole thing. I was so impressed. I don't think people understand. Miami's got problems with Tua. We've been talking about that since before Tua was a starter. I, I don't care. They got a solid defense. Tua struggled a little bit, which is going to come into play because of uh, time of possession and and field position, that kind of thing. But damn, the Bills just absolutely scored on a a really good defense, just at will. They just did what they wanted to do yesterday. Yeah, they did. They threw up fifty six on the Miami Dolphins defense, which for the past few weeks we've been saying has been playing one of the best defenses in the league. Uh, so throwing up fifty six on them, making it look easy. Uh, this coming week, which we'll get into a later on in the week with our, our playoff previews and all that. But uh, they got the Colts, who also have a really good defense. So if the Colts want any chance of winning this game, they're going to have to step up big time against Josh Allen in this high-flying Buffalo Bills offense. Yeah, no kidding. You know, right now they're they're just running through everybody right now. And as a Colts fan, it's a little intimidating, uh, right? You know, the the Bills probably, uh, like you guys have said, uh, probably the best team in the league right now. I'd take them over anybody else to win the Super Bowl right now. Um, you know, Josh Allen has just looked unbelievable, and he hasn't really even been doing all the running out of the pocket and whatnot. Uh, or, you know, he still scrambles behind the line of scrimmage. He hasn't been taken off as much, um, which, is, which is dangerous. You know, we're coming into the league, it was kind of like Kyler Murray, right? That was the his legs were were half of his game, and now now we're seeing him being able to be on the run and be really accurate throwing the ball thirty yards down the field, and that's going to be dangerous for everybody in the playoffs. Yeah, for sure. And there's a couple of things I want to uh, first. I, I really want to make a big deal about Buffalo. I mean, I'm not a huge Buffalo fan, and uh, I, being a Colts fan, the AFC East. Uh, being a Colts fan in the late 80s, early 90s, it, anybody who was a true Colts fan and understand what was going on who says they like the Buffalo Bills because of that shit we went through during the late 80s, early 90s uh, w- would be a liar. It's really hard for me to swallow. But I'm really happy for the franchise and for the, the Buffalo Bills fans because uh, yesterday was – this is the first time they have won the, the AFC East since 1995. Okay. This is the first time they have ever gone undefeated in the AFC East. They went, I looked this up. Hefe, you and I talked about this yesterday. They went seven and one in the AFC East, four out of seven years from 1988 to 1993. Of course, that's only five years. So four out of five years. That's at Indiana math. 
so they went seven to one, four, four out of five years from 88 to 93, which is the team that went to four Super Bowls in a row, which has never, never been done uh, other than, than they did. So the other thing, a couple things that I was looking at is that the Bills uh, set a new franchise record for the most points scored in a season at 501. Yesterday, they scored 56 points against the Dolphins. Which, which can I add real quick? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, they threw up 56 and three quarters because they had zero at the end of the first. Makes it oh. a little bit more impressive. Yeah, that, that is even more impressive because the, the 56 points yesterday was second only to when they scored 58 in 1966 against the Miami Dolphins. Isn't it weird how history repeats itself like that? <laughs> um, and I just like to throw in here just for comparison standpoint, I also looked up the team that holds the record for the most points in a season is the 2013 Denver Broncos at 606 points. Um, they're no, nowhere near that, but it doesn't matter because 501 is still points is still picking them up and putting them down. And uh, what they did to Miami yesterday was just absolutely incredible. So I hope they celebrate. Buffalo fan, you know, the Patriots are out of the way. I'm a, I'm a Dolphins fan. I'm glad the Patriots are out of the way. I was looking forward to celebrating a little more than I get a chance to. I, so I certainly understand where Buffalo has come from, and I hope they're throwing a party in Buffalo. But don't spend it all. It's not like you just made it into the playoffs. Buffalo has probably got another, what, six weeks? Where, is that where we're at? Four weeks? Five weeks? They may have another five weeks of football. So, yeah. And while while we're talking about you know Buffalo and how they should be celebrating, uh, let's talk about the other side of that game real quick. A team that just barely made it or barely missed the playoffs this year, the Dolphins. And what are they going to do with both of their quarterbacks coming up? Well, I was going to say. Uh, I mean, we we talked about it all season. Tua wasn't ready. He needs more development. I understand bringing him in, getting him reps and experience. Ultimately, I think he'll be a solid quarterback if he continues to get better. Uh, but we talked about, like I said, we talked about it all season long. It wasn't the right move to pull Fitzpatrick in favor of Tua. But uh, as we said, this was Ryan Fitzpatrick's team. They were winning with Fitzpatrick as a starter, making comebacks when he was added in there. Uh, the offense was able to push the ball down the field, put up points. It's a shame that Flores made this move, and even more of a shame – that Fitz was ruled out of a must-win Week 17 game with COVID because I would have loved this scene if he could have proven us right and made the game against the Bills a little closer than it was. Do I think they would have been able to win that game against the Bills? Not with the way Buffalo has been playing as of late. Uh, undoubtedly, two is the guy now, though. Uh, Fitzpatrick said to become an unrestricted free, free agent this offseason, and I'd be very surprised if the Dolphins and him can come up uh, with an agreement on the new contract so my question for you guys, uh, in addition to discussing the Dolphins, is what's going to be next for Fitzpatrick? Personally, if Phillip Rivers retires and the Colts don't pull off a trade for a quarterback like Matt Stafford or maybe even Carson Wentz, do they make a move on a one, one two-year deal on Fitzmagic? Well, I know we had this conversation a couple weeks ago, and I know Hefe doesn't think so. But, okay, let, I, let, me, let me back up and hit a couple of your questions. First of all, uh, Fitzpatrick's decisions, it, it, it's no doubt it's to his team. That's why the switch was made. It should have been made when it was, in my opinion. I'm not the coach. Hindsight, they, were, they should have made the playoffs. They didn't because of the switch. No doubt they were looking f ahead to next year. Maybe even Flores thought he could get it done this year, but, but he couldn't. But we're looking ahead to next year. They got crazy draft picks coming up. The Dolphins are for real. They're, they're here to stay. I, I, doubt this ship, I doubt this ship heads the other direction. With that said, we've talked about this too. With two, with two as a parent attitude and Fitzpatrick's apparent attitude, there is a world where he stays and and he backs him up. So I guess for Fitzpatrick, obviously not knowing him personally, trying to put myself in his shoes, I would look at: Do I want to move again? You know, I mean, the guy's been with what fourteen teams? Too many to count. Yeah, I, too many to count. Does he want? Does he want to move again? You know, I mean, I, I would think at this point, I can tell you, uh, he's younger than I am, but I can tell you, my life, I, I, you know, I would be like, I don't know that I want another city, especially if I'm in Miami and I gotta go to some place like Minnesota. You know, I, I would think honestly, I would think long and hard about that. The other thing is, if he thinks Miami's poised for a Super Bowl, 
there's a ring in being a backup and mentoring your your young quarterback. So he's got a lot of intangible things that he that he's going to think about. But I think he could uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, he could there's there's several teams that would pick him up to start. And Indianapolis, in my opinion, is a viable option if those other things I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I know we're going to talk about Aaron Rodgers a little bit, but uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers at the beginning of the season was unhappy at Green Bay because of the draft selection uh, they took. He felt slighted. I don't see Green Bay letting him go. We're going to talk about that. Um, so that he's been the conversation. Stafford certainly been the conversation. Wentz, unfortunately, is in the conversation. Uh, but I have to agree with Hefe. I don't know that Reich would take that gamble. Fitzpatrick fits for another year. I think he's a guy that can come in. He if, if Rivers doesn't want to stay, which Rivers said has said he wa- that he wants to come back for another year. Uh, originally, it was a one and done. He said he'd like to come back for another year. Um, I think that goes away if they can upgrade to somebody like. Stafford or Aaron Rodgers that has a good solid, you know, three, five, seven years, whatever the case may be left. I think Fitzpatrick has shown he can come in and he can start, but it's only a temporary fix. And maybe not as, as much as I love Fitzpatrick. I don't know that he's, he's better than Rivers. I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying he's not as good as Rivers, but I don't know that he's better than Rivers. So I don't know that it's an upgrade per se, but it's certainly in a pinch uh, is an easy fix. So I, I, I don't want, I don't rule that possibility out. Yeah, it'd be interesting to get him to come in, kind of be the mentor to, to Jacob Eason, kind of like he's been doing to Tua. Hopefully there's a little less confusion in who's your starter for the whole season. Um, you know, it, it was a real mess with the fits to a thing. Um, like you guys mentioned, if Fitz plays, they, they, they probably end up in the playoffs. Um, so, you know, wherever Fitz goes, I hope that, uh, you know, he gets – a fair shot and gets an opportunity to finish his career out the way he would want to finish it out. Uh, but as a journeyman quarterback, I assume he's probably going to keep doing the same thing, go and mentor a young quarterback and finish out his career, making a couple million holding a clipboard. Yeah, for sure. And I'd like to finish this conversation up with there, there, there are two points I'd like to make. First of all, is I will stand forever that Flores shot himself in the foot. They'd be in the playoffs had he, had he not made the switch and stuck with Fitzpatrick. Agreed. Bef- up until yesterday, I would have said they could have won the Super Bowl. They wouldn't have beat Buffalo yesterday. No, I don't care no. if they would have had – I don't care if they had had Aaron Rodgers and, or Joe Montana or Peyton Manning yesterday. Buffalo came to win the game, and that's exactly what they did. So, um, you know, a little bit of that pressure is off. I, I, but still, but once you get in – Anything could happen. And Miami was good enough to make a run to the end, and it's, it's unfortunate. But they got good draft picks coming up. They got a good coach. I'm not going to keep busting Brian Flores' balls because he – I really like what the guy's doing. We, and we called it last year. It's funny now when you start reading all these expert opinions about how they knew Miami was rebuilding, how good they were going to be. I'm calling horse shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They – man, they were – the whole tank for Tua and his – is he losing on purpose or does he just suck and Miami's got nothing? And I mean, they, nobody, nobody was buying into Brian Flores. Uh, I don't want to say nobody, like we were the only people in the world, but uh, the general media that covers the NFL had nothing positive to say about, about Brian Flores and Miami Dolphins until about week eight of this year. But I, the three of us did, we, we knew, actually I picked them to win the division. So hats off to Brian Flores. Um, I'm really excited to see what he does for next year. Since we brought up Wentz, let's slide into this disaster that's going on in Philadelphia. This is some Bill O'Brien bullshit that's going on right now. This is how you screw up a franchise. Um, and I don't, I don't know the people. This, this whole Jalen Hurts thing from yesterday, you know, people are like, oh, he was tanking. And, and then people are arguing, oh, he's trying to get a better draft pick. They got three up. Or, and then other people are like, oh, well, Jalen Hurts didn't do well, and so they pulled him out. And, not, you know, Wentz wants out. We know Wentz wants out um, because he doesn't get along with, with Peterson. And then somebody said, well, he, he, you know, he benched Jalen Hurts because of uh, his, his first half stats. Uh, he had like a quarterback rating of like 25 or 26 in the first half or whatever the case may be. And I, I'm, I'm calling bullshit. This is some Adam Gay scapegoating shit what this is. Uh, Peterson, this sick, this ship is sinking. It's been sinking since Frank Reich left. Um, I don't care if Wentz is hurt. I don't care if he's not what you thought he was. I don't care. There's no reason the Eagles should have been floundering as they have been 
that responsibility goes to the head coach. Now, you know what he's done yesterday? You got a kid that you just, you just gave him the keys and said, hey, we got full faith in you. You're the quarterback of the future. And what do you do the last game of the season? That means absolutely nothing. It wouldn't matter if his quarterback rating was seven. Let the kid play and get some experience and show him he's your quarterback. So you know what he's done now? He's created a quarterback controversy going into the offseason. This guy needs fired, and he's fired right now. The parade is over in Philadelphia. I don't care how close you got uh, to being a juggernaut or what you thought was going to happen when, when they won the Super Bowl. It's over. The party is over, and he's going to do nothing but do what Bill O'Brien did and just keep screwing this franchise up. Rant over. Yeah, I understand. I understand as a head coach and organization, you're always evaluating players. And also, a loss with a, in that game Sunday will give you the number six overall pick in the draft instead of the number nine. So I, I get all that. But you play to win the game. Jalen Hurts wasn't having the best game, but he still had two rushing touchdowns. And you were only down, what, three, six points at that point when he was pulled? So you're more than capable of winning this football game. I'm sure that no. Philadelphia Eagle players other than Sudfeld was happy about the move because no player wants to lose. They're there to play. They're there to win the game. Unfortunately, from a player's perspective, I think you lose a little trust and credibility with your coach at that point. Instead of Doug Peterson being with them, which coaches have to play double duty and be there with their guys, stand up for their guys, be one of them while also being in with management because they're the ones signing your paycheck and making the decision whether you have a job or not. But this move, in my opinion, showed each player on the Philadelphia Eagles that Doug Peterson is not with them. He's with the management, and that might fracture this locker room more than you'd think. Yeah, it's just it's a move you just can't make, especially not in the middle of a game, right? Like if you if you have – orders to to lose a game to get a better draft pick or whatever the case may be then then call bad plays you don't take out the obvious better quarterback right like this guy Sudfeld comes in who is this guy nobody's ever heard of this guy nobody will ever hear about this guy ever again oh, wait a minute he's didn't a he play at IU yeah he played at IU <laughs> come okay, on Jeffy well, know your wrong. Wrong. so that yeah, the Hoosier <laughs> is trash okay we, <laughs> we don't have to talk about the Hoosier. Uh, but you know, you have this guy coming in. Nobody's ever going to hear this guy's name again. You know, it was it was obvious tanking on live television. We saw it front and center. There's nothing, Doug. You know, Doug. All oh, he he deserves some snaps. He's been here for four years. He deserves some snaps. There are probably plenty of guys. Jim Sorge is the best backup quarterback ever. Say he probably deserves some snaps at some point. He didn't get them. Why? Because Peyton Manning was going to win the game. Like. There was a real good chance Jalen Hurts wins that game. When he gets out of the game, they're down by three. You literally take him out and you lose the game. That's, I mean, that's that's the season right there. That's all your guys had left to play for was to win the game and to keep Washington out of the playoffs. And and Doug Peterson does the most Doug Peterson type shit and puts in a backup that's going to help him lose after already taking out Carson Wentz who is a better quarterback than Jalen Hurts, Doug Peterson, one of the worst coaches in the league. He needs to join Adam Gase and needs to join Anthony Lynn and get out of Philadelphia. He needs to be fired immediately. I got, hold on. I got, I got a couple more points real quick. I definitely agree. I think Doug Peterson needs to be out there. But like we said, the Eagles as an organization will do what's best for them. And although I do disagree with the move from a player's perspective, I do understand the evaluation slash draft pick motive behind it, which is tanking from an organizational standpoint. But that leads me to believe that Doug Peterson fully believes he's coming back next year as a head coach, or he would have been fighting to pull out that win. Okay. Good point. Let me, but let me reframe it in a different way. Or he was told you better win this game or you're fired. And hurts, and and then he was scrambling because his quarterback rating rating was so low, and he thought for some reason that he could he could win this game. I don't I don't know why that could have been. I have no idea why that could have been. That your scenario is probably more realistic, but at this point, I don't know what the hell's going on. When you can't figure out what the hell's going on, any any scenario is, is realistic. But to go back to your initial point, you you moved up three draft picks and potentially sabotage your team's confidence and the locker room swagger. 
You win. You Look, I don't care if they didn't make the playoffs or not. They were still in contention for the division title. And I don't care if that's because you had 12 wins or you had six wins. As a coach, that is leverage to build momentum in your team. And then you get the last win of the season against one of your divisional rivals and you knock them out of the playoffs. All that carries over to next year and is worth way more than moving from ninth to sixth in the draft. I do agree. A bonehead move. And I, if it's management, then I, then I don't know what to tell you. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if he's on his own or is a conspiracy. It was just a horrible, horrible decision the way you look at it. And usually, you know, I'm pretty good about saying it was a horrible decision, but it's hindsight and we don't know where they were coming from. And it, had they pulled it off, they'd be a genius. I don't see that happening here. I, 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 I think this is just more indicative of some Bill O'Brien crap and, and the organization's dead. He, and not that he can't go somewhere else and be successful. He's just not going to do it in Philadelphia. It's over. Over. So speaking of which, let's slide into uh, coaches being fired. Let's move into the Jags. Obviously, Doug Marone was fired. I know, you know, I'm a big proponent of giving coaches time, but dude, the Jags are so bad. Uh, you, you have professional athletes, the best athletes in the freaking world at your fingertips, and the dog's going to shine on a dog's ass every once in a while. If you can't pull out four or five wins in this league minimum, there's a huge problem. And Jacksonville shouldn't have even got the first one. I don't even know how they did it. It wasn't even his team that did it. Um, so he should have been gone. Number one pick in the draft. Obviously, big quarterback coming in. And now there's a big rumor that there may be a big coach coming in. What do you guys think about the Urban, Urban Meyer rumor? You know, I don't, I don't really know how to feel about it. He, he doesn't have NFL experience, so you never know. I mean, just look at Nick Saban. Came into the Dolphins, wasn't anything special. Had to go back down to college, so – uh, he's a, he is a big name. He's a proven college coach, but like I said, just because you're a proven college coach doesn't translate into being a good NFL coach. Uh, but if you're trying to lure Trevor Lawrence out of going back to Clemson, so you can snag him with the number one overall pick, bringing in a guy like Urban Meyer might not be a bad idea. I don't know. I don't really think you know Urban Meyer is going to come to the NFL and be some kind of huge success. I, I think he is a lot like Chip Kelly, and I think he'll be received a lot like Chip Kelly. Um, you know, I, I could be wrong there, but uh, it, it just, you know, the personalities seem the same, um, kind of dickish, you know. There's, there's a difference between, you know, you have these college kids that you have to teach to be men, and then you have NFL guys who, who are men trying to feed their families. It's a completely different way to get across to guys. I don't know if that'll work. Um, not really too worried about it because the Jags have a couple years worth of a rebuild and, and Urban, if he wants to take charge of that, then be my guest. But by the time he gets done with that, people are going to be out on him as a coach because the Jaguars aren't going to be winning anyways. Uh, the real question to me when it comes to the Jaguars would be more of does if they do take Urban Meyer, right, do they take Ohio State quarterback Justin Fields or do they – keep with what everybody's been talking about and take Trevor Lawrence. Now, that is an interesting question that you posed to me yesterday, and I've been giving a lot of thought. Uh, at first, I, I don't want to speak for Zach, but I'm going to assume Zach's reaction was probably like, oh, hell no, which is what most people, most people's reactions, it was what mine was at the, at the beginning. But there's also an argument to be made for trading down. Trading down to find somebody who wants to trade up to the number one spot who to get Trevor Lawrence, and I don't know where Justin Fields is projected to go. Does anybody know? Uh, I think he's a number three quarterback on the board. I want to okay. say somebody had him in like the top ten at least, I think. So there's something to be said for trying to work that deal and get Justin Fields and Urban Meyer and some sort of, of, of compensation to go with it. Uh, I don't know if that's the case. And, and honestly, I don't, I don't know enough about on, – honestly, as much as I hate to admit this, I don't know enough about either quarterback to really make that comparison. I'm not a huge college football guy. Um, I do know that I've heard that Trevor Lawrence is a generational – I've heard, heard a term he's a generational quarterback, that they, it's like a Manning, just comes along every once in a while, and uh, you know he's going to be good. I don't, 
I, I don't know if that's the case or not. So that's all I have to, to show in there that they could, they could try to, to package this up um, because you're, you're taking a kid like Justin Fields and you're putting him in the hands of somebody that knows him well. So his stock goes up in that situation as compared to two guys who've never worked before. And that, that's my only point there. I do know that college coaches moving directly into the NFL um, is kind of a rarity. I mean, there, there are a couple of guys like Bill Walsh and uh, Jimmy Johnson and Dick Vermeil, who won Philadelphia Eagles Super Bowl and then won um, – Super Bowl with the Rams, right? Me the coach of the Rams when they won the Super Bowl? I believe it was Dave Fermi on virtue. And Paul Brown, of course. And then there's Jim Harbaugh, so which was kind of the, the other way around. And then there's Barry Switzer, but Barry Switzer Barry Switzer drove the car that Jimmy Johnson built and he was a jackass. And had no business. He was he was Jerry Jones Patsy, like most of those coaches are. And, you know, then you got like uh, Chip Kelly and uh, Nick Saban, Steve Spurrier, Al Grove, uh, you know, and then we're going to get into a list of guys you've never even heard of. So it seems like it's a hard leap. And it makes sense because being a head coach in college and in the NFL, anybody who's, I mean, I've never coached in the NFL. Uh, I can see they're two disparately two different major different things. Whereas if you're coming up and you're a, you're a linebackers coach and a defensive coordinator and you're around the organization, that's a, that's a much easier transition. So I don't know what a reminder is going to do. And I think we talked about this yesterday and one of you said something about, uh, you know, urban Meyer has a propensity to, uh, to walk away from his job. So, you know, do the whole Nick Saban thing, you invest all this money, you make all these trades and go with the, the, the alternate quarterback as most people would say. And then all of a sudden, uh, things don't go his way, and all of a sudden he's got headaches, and boom, he's gone again. So there's a whole gamble that goes along with that as well. Uh, all right, well, I, let's slide right into the Chargers. They dropped Anthony Lynn, who's twelve and four last year, seven and nine this year. That's a pretty big backslide. That's a really big backslide, and I know that we've talked about uh, guys like Tomlinson, you know, being twelve and four one year, ten and five one year, and then being eight and eight. Um, there's a big difference between seven nine and eight and eight. I'll make that argument every day. And uh, I think the signal that he was 12 and four, this is a Jim Caldwell effect right here. And, and, well, and I used to call it the Barry Switzer effect, but Jim Caldwell uh, did it way better. He, he screwed things up way better than Barry Switzer did. Guy comes in and wins like that. It's not his team. He didn't build it. He's turning knobs. And um, seven and nine is more indicative of what's going on with Anthony Lynn. And uh, I think he, a lot of his decisions that we saw, I think this is a good decision to let him go. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I was making this call a few weeks ago, if you guys remember. But I was very surprised. They won, what, their last four games of the season, I think it was. Uh, but regardless, he, he was 33 and 31. He had a winning record as a head coach of the Chargers. But the thing, the biggest thing with him is his decision making. There were multiple games this year where they could have put points on the board or even could have won the game had it not been for his decision making. And you just can't do that in the NFL. So although they turn it on late, although I think the Chargers have a good foundation, uh, they have a great court, or I shouldn't say great because he's still a rookie, but Justin Herbert should be a very good quarterback in this league. So I think the Chargers are poised to be good down the road I just don't think Anthony Anthony Lynn's a guy to lead them there so I agree with this firing I mean to be so close to 500 with the roster that he's had over the years I mean they've had so much talent if you go back and look at each of the rosters while he's been there there's just so much talent on the offense and on the defense stack whoever the GM there is for the Chargers he's he's done a really good job over the years of putting together uh, a really good team. And Anthony Lynn has disappointed every single year um, to not even be able to win playoff game. I mean, it, he probably should have already been gone. It's hard to fire a guy when he has winning seasons. So, um, you know, it's a good thing the Chargers had this happen this year uh, because they have a generational talent type of quarterback right now. A uh, pretty good team overall. Um, they're obviously going to need to re-sign some guys. They're going to have to have another good draft. Uh, to to get it going again, but but the future looks bright. They need to get a coach in here that can come in here and, and do the right things with the talent that's there. Anthony Lynn was not anywhere near good enough to get the job done. So uh, I think for the foreseeable future, 
as long as the Chargers have a decent coach, we should see the Chargers putting up a real fight with the Chiefs every year for that division and for the top seed in the AFC. Yeah, great points, both of you. And I, th- I, I don't think people realize they're like, again, they're like, well, they were so close to 500 and, and he, he had a winning record there. Yeah, Hefe, you made, a, you made a great point about having all the talent that he's had and he should have done better. And the point is, is that it's moving backwards. Now, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up Tom Telesco because we're not just talking about Anthony Lynn's job. We're talking about Tom Telesco's job. So Tom Telesco has to decide whether he's going to ride or die with Anthony Lynn and, and potentially lose his job or if he's, going to, if he's going to show his owner that he's, he's actively seeking to upgrade this program and put it back on track. And I think that's what Telesco's done. He, he, he evaluated the situation. was like, I don't care if they were close to 500. I don't care if he had a, you know, a winning record while he was here. Are they getting better? Can they get better? Is this the guy that can win a Super Bowl? And if not, and if he's going to get my ass fired, he's gone. That's exactly the way I would look at it. I'm sure that's exactly the way Tom Telesco's looking at it. Um, they ha- he's, he wants to stop the bleeding right now. If the Chargers were 3 and, and 13 last year, and now they're 7 and 9, we're having a completely different conversation. But they weren't, and so we're not. So I... I I, th- I mean, we all agree. I think Telesco made the right decision here. Yep, absolutely. And, I mean, when, you, when you're talking about uh, the coaching openings that are available right now, I mean, obviously the Jags look like they could get Trevor Lawrence, um, which would mean the Jets probably take Justin Fields, um, or maybe they keep Sam Donald. Nobody knows what the Jets are going to do yet. But with the way things are looking, I think even still – with with the way things looked for the Chargers most of the season, I think that's got to be the most attractive job. I mean, maybe you look at Houston with Deshaun Watson because he is so damn good. But between Justin Herbert and the offensive weapons and the defense that's been stacked together there for the Chargers, I think the Chargers are probably the most attractive job for head coaches right now. Yeah, that's plus you're in L.A. Plus you're in L.A. And and that does come into play. If you're a multimillionaire. Being a multimillionaire anywhere is pretty cool. But being a multimillionaire in L.A. or Miami, in my opinion, is uh, much more attractive. I've said that for a long time. So speaking of which, thank God Adam Gase got fired. Hey, you finally got your wish. But what what the hell took them so long? They let him. We talked. About, we talked about this. Uh, like midway through the season, like week eight or something. I'm like, this guy is terrible. He's shown he's got, you've got years of him being not very good in Miami. He's, he's run this whole thing in the ground. There's a bunch of weird stuff going on and you gave him another eight weeks to destroy the culture in the locker room. I I don't know what took him so long, but the funny thing is, is that, and I know Hefe, we talked about this. You said that that they're notorious for not hiring coaches mid season, right? But they didn't even wait till this morning. (laughs) They fired him yesterday, (laughs) which I find comical. They wouldn't fire him all season. Uh, And then they they didn't wait until technically the day after the season was over. But So Gase is certainly gone. So let's see. We've got the Jags, the Chargers, the Jets, uh, the Texans, the Falcons, and who's the six? uh, The Lions. Yep. All looking for head coaches. Do any of those those fired coaches get a job somewhere else? Uh, Not head coach. I don't see head coach. Yeah, I can see them all going back to coordinator positions, but I can't see them sitting at head coach team. Yeah, you see, you I mean, you see coaches fired, and you and you know that they got a good shot to get hired somewhere else. That that happens. Uh, good coaches lose control of their programs. Things don't go well the the right way, and something happens, and they move to another team. I don't see that with this list of coaches. I really don't. No, um, a couple names that I've seen thrown out there for potential firings. Uh, obviously, Doug Peterson, which we discussed. Vic Fangio hasn't been doing well in Denver. He's 12 and 20. I could see that happening. Uh, I think that's more of a management thing. I think that falls back on John Elway because, uh, my opinion, they don't have a very good team overall. Uh, obviously, you're missing Von Miller. That's a big, big 
problem in, on the defense end. But, uh, yeah, I, I could see Vic Fangio getting let go this offseason. A name that kind of surprises me that's being thrown out there as well is Matt Nagy in Chicago. He's been in the playoffs two of the last three years, and he's 28 and 20. Uh, I'd be surprised if they let him go. I think he's deserving of staying in there, especially being able to come back the way they did this year and make it into the playoffs. So uh, those are three names I've seen thrown out there. Zach Taylor was out there, but the Bengals have already said that they're going to retain him again for next year. So, I mean, I'm, I, I'm critical of coaches. Um, I make no bones, but I agree with you about Matt Nagy. I, I think he deserves another shot. If you bring somebody else in, uh, you, there's no guarantee they're going to do as well as he did. And this isn't an Anthony Lynn situation where you were good and now you're getting worse and you have to stop the bleeding. Um, I also think with that said, Matt Nagy would do himself a real big favor, in my opinion, if they just went with Mitch Trubisky and just stop and just stop this bullshit. Just see what the kids got, man. Just let him let him go. Give him a chance to get some confidence. Give him a chance to gel with his teammates and give him the rope and see what he does with it. And uh, he may end up using the rope to, to save the franchise or he may end up using the rope to hang himself. But give him a chance. To, to do it without interference. Sorry, Nick Foles. It's just the way I feel about it. Yeah, and I think, you know, Nagy, having having the wherewithal and, and the, the confidence to hand off the offensive play calling uh, to somebody else midseason, I mean, when, when you've lost six, seven in a row and you're looking for answers, um, usually, you know, it's good that he didn't have too big of an ego for that moment. And he had to say, okay, I need you to do this so I can take my responsibilities as head coach. Somebody else do this. And the play calling was better. You know, Matt Nagy, Mitchell Trubisky just wasn't working out in that that shotgun, running gun, um, not running enough type of offense. But but then, you know, they change things up. They start going in the center, play action more. David Montgomery gets more involved. And then Trubisky – can look more like a star when the whole thing's not on him. Kind of like what we saw with Kevin Stefanski and the Cleveland Browns with Baker Mayfield. You just you take it out of the, the quarterback's hands a little more. You take a little more pressure off of his back, play your running game and your offensive line control the game a little bit. So I think, you know, between between Mitchell Trubisky, between Matt Nagy and his entire coaching system, I think everything has gone um, a lot better over the last half of the season. And if I'd be a Bears fan, I'd be pretty excited about 2021. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I agree. And it's, it is a huge deal. You know, a guy, like, a guy like that feels like he needs to control everything because it's his reputation, his job that's on the line. And to realize it's not working and be able to admit that publicly and hand that to someone else. You know, as a head coach, he's got a lot going on. And it may not even be that – it may not even be that that the play – the person he's handed to is a better play caller than him as much as it is that he, he can focus on it more than Nagy can and, and be able to make better decisions because of that focus. There's not so much going on. So I, I agree with you. Big, big kudos to him to do that. And he certainly, certainly should stay in Chicago, in my opinion. Um, I've, I got my phone right here in case anybody calls to ask me my opinion. Um, and Matt, if you're listening and you need a good reference, just, just let me know. I'll put one in for you. Uh, all right, some a couple of the noteworthy things. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Browns made the playoffs. They ended their 17-year skid. Kudos to them. Um, I know one of you picked the Browns. Zach, did you pick the Browns to make the playoffs? Uh, I don't believe I did, actually. I think you and I picked New England. Uh, no, I did not pick New England. I could tell you that. No. Uh, I picked Maybe that Miami. was just me. <laughs> yeah, I had Miami getting in over Cleveland. Wow. Well, since he's – Quiet, not going to say anything. I want everybody to know, Hefe picked the Browns to go to the playoffs. That's right. <laughs> Hefe got every single AFC team right. He did. Yeah. Did you know that, Hefe? Uh, I got most of the records, too. Yeah, I got the Kansas City at 14-2, and two, got that right. Buffalo, 13-3. and three. Got Pittsburgh right at 12-4, and four, but the uh, Colts and the Titans – I got wrong. And the Browns, I was one game under. I had the Browns only winning 10 games. We got 11. So, you know, good year. Good year for uh, the – I thought I was bullish on the AFC. Cause, I mean, the way it went for me was 14 wins 14, 13, 13, 12, 12, 10. And I thought, man, there's no way that's realistic. Yeah. 
and go figure, every AFC team ends up with 11 wins this year. Yeah, a it, 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 really good year for the AFC. And we even said, it, uh, well, I, I know I said it, I don't know if you guys agree with that or not, midway through the season that I thought there were there were more AFC teams uh, that were good, and but the NFC, the few NFC teams were better. And I don't know that that's the case. Uh, it doesn't appear to be that way. No, no. It's um, this AFC as they're not only everybody's getting wins, but there are a lot of really strong teams that could win this whole thing. So um, it should be an AFC year, well, I, except for the Packers, right? Yeah, the Packers are really the only wild card in that whole thing. I, I stand firm on the fact that I think all seven uh, playoff teams in the AFC can be any of the NFC teams any day of the week except for the Packers. The Packers are a wild card. Yeah. I, w- I would almost throw the Saints in there too, though. Well, I was getting ready to say the Saints because um, the Saints <laughs> – it's hard to talk about the Saints because you want to say, well, they've been lackluster. Well, they haven't really been lackluster because they won their division and they, they've beaten a lot of really good teams. They've dealt with a lot of weird stuff too, especially Breeze's injury. Um, and so, you know, that's just a testament to Sean Payton's coaching. And so the Saints are another one of those teams. As long as they're in the playoffs, they can win the whole thing. So, by the way, to go back a few minutes, you picked Miami rather than Cleveland. I did, yes. Yeah, it was Miami. You and I picked Miami, and I picked, I picked the Patriots over what? What other team? I can't remember. Buffalo over Buffalo. That's right, because I thought Miami was going to win the division. I think I have. I think I have. Uh, honestly, I had Buffalo. I think it was like nine or seven. If I'm just being honest, I wasn't real high on them. I was just going to say we all did pretty well on our predictions. I think we each missed uh, three NFC teams. And then, uh, what, just one or two? Besides Jeff, he got all his, just one or two AFC teams. So we all did pretty well on our preseason predictions when it comes to the playoffs. Yeah, I, I thought Minnesota was going to do better than they did. And they, sh- they, they should, I will maintain they should have. Um, and Dallas, right? Dallas should have done better than they did. That whole thing is, I don't, I don't want to talk about that today. And, uh, and San Francisco was the other team that I picked. And I, I don't think anybody foresaw that San Francisco would, would have as many troubles as they did either. So I, I, th- I think we all did well too. I was going to bring up uh, another noteworthy uh, achievement. And I, I, too bad he plays for uh, one of the Colts rivals. But Derrick Henry had a hell of a year this year. Uh, he had a Hall of Fame year is what he had. What, what is he, the eighth player? The player in league history, yep. Yeah, so eighth player in league history to have 2,000 yards rushing in a season. That is no small feat. There's so many things that can come into play in that, including injuries. And and uh, it's just – that's an amazing, amazing feat. So it's cool to watch that kind of history unfold, even if you don't like the Titans, which which I do. I, I mean, I, I like Vrabel. I like Tannehill. I hate it there in the division. We beat that to death. Um, I really wanted them to lose yesterday. <laughs> Really wanted them to lose, but still, uh, pretty amazing feat. And Tannehill had a great year too. Uh, it was fun to fun. I'm, I'm glad he got to redeem himself coming out of that bad situation he had with the coach that should never coach again. <laughs> yeah, Derrick Henry. He it was the fifth. He's fifth all time in single season rushing yards with 2,027. The four guys in front of him is Barry Sanders at number four, Jamal Lewis. Adrian Peterson and Eric Dickerson. So very good company to be with. Yeah. List the ones behind him. Uh, Number six, Terrell Davis. Number seven, Chris Johnson. Number eight, OJ Simpson. Now, the reason I wanted you to read those off is to put this in perspective. Because when you, when you say the four above him, that's really good company, but they still did better than him. The ones behind him that you read is still pretty damn good company. And he did better than them. Yeah. True. I just want to give the guy all the props. I mean, it was a hell of an accomplishment. And, uh, you know, it, 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 you see it about once every 10 years. Anything else you guys want to bring up? Yeah. Uh, MVP, Aaron Rodgers. He hasn't won it yet, but he's going to. Because what I say, he had the he's tied with Dan Marino for the fifth best most touchdowns in a single season with yeah. 48. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Tied uh, Dan Marino for the fifth. I th- it's Peyton Manning in there twice. Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes is up there in front of him. Uh, but he did it with only five interceptions. I think the next closest guy in interceptions that's a full-time starter was Pat Mahomes with, with six interceptions. So he not only had the most touchdowns, but the least amount of interceptions. MVP, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, I agree. I think he solidified it. Um, you know, I thought there was a chance the Bears could could win this game and that would ruin it. I thought maybe maybe if the Packers lose and Josh Allen goes off in the last game, maybe Josh Allen gets it. But Aaron locked it up. Like you said, 48 touchdowns, you know, up until, what was it, 12, 14 years ago when Peyton had uh, 49 touchdowns in the season. Like it, it, it wasn't long ago that that – Record of forty-eight touchdowns would be Aaron. Hold on, ha, right there. how many? How many years did you say? Uh, it was like fourteen years ago, I think, when Peyton originally broke the record. And close, it was sixteen. But how how does that make you feel? Yeah, that's one of those <laughs> things. You're like, it was just a few years ago. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I agree with Zach here. I think I think Aaron Rodgers locked it up. You know, an amazing season to Sean Watson. Finishes the year with the the lead league in passing yards, but to have damn near a ten to one touchdown to interception ratio is absolutely unreal. Yeah, I have no I have no arguments with that whatsoever. I I, I certainly think that's the case. I agree with both of you. And kudos for, uh, to Zach for calling out the Packers before the, se- the season even started. Hey, I had a feeling that uh, drafting Love in the draft was going to light a fire under him, and he's going to come out swinging. He sure did. That's why he's going to win the MVP and the Packers are number one seed in the NFC. Yeah. Yeah. You know, something else I want to bring up uh, real quick. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but I, I don't feel like we made a big enough deal about it. I, and we made a pretty big deal about it, but the Alex Smith story is just that. I don't think people realize Alex Smith story that that's an NFL film for generations to come when you look at the like the Joe Theismann leg injury I mean you guys know you know about the Joe Theismann leg injury and it was before you were born but it's because it was so dramatic and not only is this the same type of injury but the man came back from it and and he's going to the playoffs playoffs Playoffs. (laughs) you know and I saw I saw a tweet that said Alex Smith was told he might die was told they might have to amputate his leg, told he might never walk again, told he'd probably never play football again. He had 17 surgeries, and last night he started a football game and carried his team in the playoffs. I don't know if that doesn't yeah, constitute comeback uh, player of the year. I don't know what does. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing that he has came back after that gruesome injury. Uh, everything that he has gone through to be able to come back, be competitive – be good, beat out a first-round pick into Wayne Haskins, uh, lead this team into the playoffs. No doubt he is going to win the Comeback Player of the Year award uh, and any other sports awards like the ESPYs or something. I'm sure he will be winning those types of awards, and rightfully so. It's a great story. I'm glad we have been able to witness it, and kudos to him for having that determination and that ability to overcome all the adversity that he's had to come through to get to this point. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've been somebody that ever since Alex Smith was with the Niners, you know, I've been somebody that backed Alex Smith. I thought he, he's he been underrated for so long. And I think we really saw that when he was with the Chiefs um, and then handed the reins over to Patrick Mahomes when he left. And, and I mean, no doubt Washington wouldn't have even come close to sniffing the playoffs this year. Um, obviously, if the division wasn't trash, but also if Alex Smith wasn't there to save the day, you know, if you were relying on Dewey Haskins and and Taylor Heineke only, um, you probably only end up with two or three wins this season. So it's been an amazing ride this season for Alex Smith and, and the Washington football team. Um, and I do think that the Comeback Player of the Year award should for sure be named after Alex Smith. There's nothing – I mean, like Brad was saying, I mean, he was told the infection in his leg was going to kill him. They told him they needed to amputate the leg, that he would never play football game. He might not walk right ever again. To come back and do what he's done, 
They need to rename the trophy after them. It's not even up for debate at this point. Agreed. Agree completely with the renaming the trophy after him. I, I'm, I'm all about that. Great point. Uh, one thing that you guys haven't seen yet, I, I have a friend of mine who, uh, from in, he's from Indianapolis. His name's Jonathan Jones, and he is a, um, he is a professional mascot. And, I mean, that's what he does is he goes to work for organizations. I think he was Boomer. I, I think he might have been Boomer for a while in Indiana with the Pacers. He, he was rowdy for the Indianapolis Indians, um, but he's also uh, traveled all over the country and, and, you know, this is what he does. And he posted something today about Alex Smith that he has a friend of his named Tom Michael Patsis, uh, which who lives in Brownsburg, Indiana, which, uh, Hefe, that's where you grew up. And um, he o- owns a company called Cold Hard Art. And he took Alex Smith's leg brace and made him uh, uh, made a replica of the Super Bowl trophy out of his leg brace hardware um, as like a trophy for Alex Smith. And it is really, really, really cool. We're going to post that onto our Facebook and Twitter page after uh, this episode at Horseman Sports. Um, so you'll definitely want to check that out. It is way cool. Yeah, I saw that. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And awesome. Something he can look back to and be proud of that he's made this comeback. It, it's probably the best. It's probably the most important trophy he'll ever earn without a doubt. It really, it really puts everything in perspective. I, not that I've gone through something like, I mean, I've, I've had brain surgery. So, um, but I haven't had that type of thing where I was going to lose my leg or lose my life or that kind of thing. And to come back from that, just the fact that he did that puts, puts wins and losses and everything else into perspective. All right. Enough of uh, just being all over Alex Smith. We were just all three impressed. Wanted to bring it up. Anything else you guys want to talk about? Uh, who ended up winning the Pick'em League? Yeah, so the uh, – and this year's Pick'em League. Jeff, do you know who won? Uh, the last that I saw, I'd seen Zach at the top still, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Congratulations, Zach. You won the Thank you. Big Skin Pick'em. Uh, you finished first with 176 total picks, correct picks. Willie on the west side, coming in, finishing second, uh, ahead of uh, Hefe, and then uh, I'm bringing up the rear. I, I, I mean, I, I missed a week. The picks I would have had, I would have hit 10. That put me at 171. Hefe had 167, but could have, should have, would have, and didn't have. I didn't put the picks in. I didn't finished third so the top three in the pigskin pick them uh espn pigskin pick them for the horsemen are zach at number one willie on the west side is second and hefe uh at third place so congratulations gentlemen thank you it was a it was a fun season glad to be a part of it i hope that uh next season we can get some more competition in here because it sucks winning all the time uh no it doesn't i take that back no it no one no yeah (laughs) <laughs> I know Zach way better than that to believe in it. That's true. Uh, yeah. So we would love to have you next year and uh, we're, we're wanting to beat this up, uh, get some prizes in here, get some, some guys on here to represent their team, which leads me uh, to another thing. I want to let people know if you know football and I guess we'll even qualify if you think, you know, football, and you have a favorite team that you want to come on and talk about in the off season, we would love to have you. We like, I mean, we, we're, we're football fans. We, you know, we're not, uh, we're not guys that get paid millions of dollars to study this all day long, but we love this game. We understand the game. We love talking about it, but I think all, all three of us would admit that we like guys coming in here that have favorite teams that can come in and teach us about their favorite team. Things we don't know, things we're not paying attention to because I don't, I don't give a shit about the Detroit Lions, but if you're a Detroit Lions fan, I, hmm, was that a Freudian slip that I picked the Detroit Lions? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we had somebody from the Lions come on and, and teach us about the Lions. So if you've got a favorite team and you know football and you're comfortable talking about it with us, we'd love to have you on and talk about your team in depth in the offseason, especially when we make moves. Um, we're looking to have more guests. So make sure that um, – you hang with us, and we'd love to have you on the Pigskin Pick'em next year. All right, anything else? It's kind of an important note here. Uh, the Saints 
Had they drawn a Saturday playoff game, Alvin Kamara was probably not going to play. But since they play on Sunday in the wild card game, Alvin Kamara should be back off the COVID list for Sunday for the Saints. Yeah, I'm sure that was crazy how that worked. Complete coincidence. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't believe that whatsoever. All right, this is usually where I tell you it's not too late to go head-to-head against us in the weekly pick but that is incorrect. You're going to have to be put on the wait list for next year. Um, but you still go to our Facebook and Twitter page at Orson Sports and uh, check out everything else we got there. Also, uh, fantasy's over. Guys, it's playoff time. This is where I'm telling you we need, we need the soundbite here. Don't talk about it. playoffs. You kidding me? Playoffs? I can't say that word without hearing Jim Moore in my head. I just can't. Playoffs? <laughs> kind of playoffs? You kidding me? So it's playoff time, and we're going to be back here on Thursday to go over the playoff games uh, for this week, the wild card weekend, and set everything up for you. And then we will be with you every week as we break the games down and then talk about the next games. And we have – some special guests coming up that we will be talking about here shortly and release the news. And we're very excited. So uh, keep an eye out. Tell all your friends. Until then, thanks for joining us. See you Thursday. 